Fantastic. So we are uh, excited now to take an opportunity to sit down with all the speakers so far. So uh, Sarah, if you could join us at the table and Vasa and Christina. And what we'll do is uh, have a short conversation. And, oh. and then open up for questions. So. Thank you all. This is in, uh, such a rich uh, layout of, of experiences that we've seen around sort of these, these spaces between fiction and nonfiction that you're producing. And I wonder if we could spend a minute, because this, comp this, this sort of series of events uh, in the last few days has been so much about crossing <laughs> disciplines, and here at the table, we have a kind of uh, a set of disciplines that's not even yet completely articulated. I wonder if you could spend a moment to kind of give us a sense for your audience as you make these arguments and sort of make these fabulated worlds. The audience and disciplines. So thinking oh. through the, your anti-disciplinary or disciplinary you mean like mode. like who am I speaking to? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I guess um, for me it's, uh, a, it is interdisciplinary, but I think it's bringing the technological into various different fields mm. and also bringing feminist thought into other disciplines. So it's a, I don't think, I know, obviously this is very media technology studies, but I think that these sort of underlie many of the disciplines already. So I hope that's an adequate answer. Yeah. yeah. Do we share, Mike? Well, you, you have to share, yes, yeah. <laughs> like um, everything. <laughs> so, as Daniela mentioned, to begin with, we did a joint thesis across the disciplines of media and communication studies and interaction design, and that was actually very much of our, uh, the, the place that we were at. They had imagined something, like the merging of two disciplines, and we, through our thesis work, we actually did that merge in one piece, uh, but it was also two, it was one and two at the same time, you know, both doing the work of media and communication studies and interaction design and doing something that was uh, something else. <laughs> and we went, we, we turned to feminist techno science to find inspiration for that. Um, so feminist techno science is very important for us. But as we've uh, continued, I think, environmental humanities or environmental post-humanities have become more and more important, so crossing social science, humanities, and design, but also, I guess, quite a lot of, at least, interfacing with natural sciences, which we don't find that very much of in most design. So maybe I could add something also just about design. So we use the word design quite broadly in our presentation and uh, we primarily refer to design as something coming out of or being related to industry. Uh, but I think it's also maybe worth mentioning that um, in our work we also try to trouble that notion that design is just something that is in relation to industry. and. Uh, at uh, Malmö University, where we did our joint thesis, uh, I would say that there are many other forms of design, so for example participatory design, uh, that comes more out of an, uh, uh, an idea about democracy and how design can be used, or how design can be democratized and um, much more of a participatory process, as well as uh, in our work we also draw on speculative design, so it's also just the discipline of design to think about how it becomes different things depending on what uh, what you combine it with and different economical systems and politics. Uh, 
Great. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting to think about this sort of student composition, right, that you're speaking to in design school and a media studies program and sort of those, those complications. Uh, I, I'm wondering if you could speak to, in particular, this, the, the kind of contrast, the two, two presentations set up between brokenness, right, this, the, the sort of embrace of the broken and the reparative and lens of care work. Um, how do you make sense of the, the relationship in both your work? Um, I guess, uh, yeah, I was, one of the last things you two said about, like, you know, set, really centering ongoing practices of care. And I think um, my first book on temporality and labor, I didn't look at um, gender specifically, even though it was like hanging in there, because I didn't want to isolate um, like women's time or women's temporality in these larger discussions. And then, as this project's been unfolding, I've been trying to talk about um, like feminist techno science or feminist technology without talking about care. Not because I don't think care is important, but because it's too often attributed to just like the social reproduction, the reproduction of the social order and tending to the world and maintenance and repair. And I was thinking, um, although like care is at the center, the broken machine in a way is just not engaging in, in that element of care. On, like sort of not as a, I think I'm trying to refuse ty like to try to expand the way that people can perceive um, feminist refusal and feminist politics where it's not just about care. But then that's not to say what you're doing isn't amazing and important. It's just I I want to see what happens if I leave that or leave that aside. So yes. So well. Um, yeah, in our work, care and repair and maintenance has been important, but we're also, and this is something that we're kind of struggling with at the moment, so a lot of the care theory that we're basing our work on is Puy de la Bella Casa, who's, for example, well, she tries to trouble or expand care to not only be something uh, that involves humans, but that can also be... Uh, across more than humans. Uh, but some of it has been also developed as part of permaculture, which is very much you know, based on circularity and, um, and in our specific cases, the idea of circularity is also doesn't quite work <laughs> because you, know, um, you can't put the polluted plants in a compost, let's say, or it works differently at least. So we, yeah, yeah, we don't have an answer to this, but we're kind of struggling with how well these figures work in different contexts, depending on, yeah, what does it mean to repair? What does it, is not everything should be maintained or not everything maybe should yeah. be repaired mm -hmm. or to what, uh, repair to what? I was going to just add to this because one of the ways that I define technology is a decision about what will we care about. Like every technology actually in a sense is built to take care of something. Like really that's what it's doing. So it's even, I think this is why your project is so interesting because it's that conscious decision of well what will this take care of? Does it need to take care of this? So yeah, that's the other link I think with this. And just finally, I, I, I'm curious if you have thoughts on what a kind of multi-species broken machine looks like. Isn't that what we're living in? <laughs> <laughs> so I. <laughs> I think very much, very much in the spirit of both talks, there, that there's an, a provocation to kind of think through longer time frames and sort of bring you back your work as this sort of challenging us to, to imagine a, a kind of technological future that is both about the, the you know, production of, of like where these, these technologies are coming from, so the supply chain dynamics as well as the flows into right, the next generation of the, the thing, so where that, that lands. So I wonder if there's a kind of longer time frame at which the multi-species brokenness unfolds. So if we could uh, just ask for a few questions from the audience. Oh, great. Hi, um, I have a question for Sarah first. Um, 
it's uh, how the uh, manif manifesto of the broken machine relates its, um, itself in the, um, to the art, uh, to the glitch art movement of the 90s. And the other one is uh, I couldn't not notice that all the speakers of today are, this is more for the curator, are uh, women, which of course is, I have nothing against it, but <laughs> does it seem like, um, is it, it might look like uh, a female version of the toxic masculinity that you are talking about? I don't, I can't compute your question. <laughs> no, I, I feel like and it's, it could look like, if it's, it's on one, the thing that we are criticizing about this toxic masculinity we are talking about, it's that it's only one-sided and it's very much uh, male-oriented side also. The, uh, so if the same happens on the, on the other side, it's not, it's, it's not better, no, it's the same. I, I know it was a question for you, but I'll, I'll, I'll answer the first part. Because patriarchy has nothing to do with men and women. There's not two things. There, so I think for the question actually presupposes a gender binary that doesn't exist. And so it's, like, it's not men against women. I mean, that's the... That's, yeah, but yeah. this is what I, I was asking, because this is what this looks like a little bit also. But that no? only looks that way because you're reading things through this binary. So okay. what I'm suggesting is that uh, women can be patriarchal misogynists too. So maybe that's helpful for your understanding. <clears throat> no, but it, it's not about looking down on me now because it's... No, no, because no. That, no, but because that's what it looks like, you know, that you're looking down at things this way. You're looking down at me in this moment when I'm having this question. No, I'm, I'm saying that it, I don't think anybody said this is like women versus men. I'm su suggesting that the critique is of patriarchy. <laughs> no, no, so, no, but yeah. I also don't want to, to say that. But I also think that it would be also nice to... Okay, but I also agree on the thing that this doesn't have to be binary, actually. Yeah. Right. But <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, but still the question about the glitch art we, movement and the relationship with question. the machine. Is it okay? Yeah, I still had the, the first question about the glitch art movement in relationship uh, in relation on the of the broken machine manifesto. With the relationship between the two? Yeah, I haven't thought about this as, other than the interrupted interrupted element, uh, element of glitch. But no, I'm not writing about glitch. But I will look into this. Thank you. If I may broach another subject, um, I wonder, I'm, I'm very interested myself in what you call artistic research. And I, I really love these talks, and, 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 but I was very intrigued by the way that your project seems so, go so far in the research part that, uh, I mean, I can only be in awe by all the things that you've been, all the knowledge and the insights you've been accumulating. But I suppose maybe you can say a little bit about where you come from as artists or how you did the research. I find it an exciting possibility, this artistic research. And at the same time, I see a lot of cases where it, it sort of becomes problematic. And one of the reasons is that it all that it tends to always come from the artists who want to be recognized. And I'm not saying that you don't completely deserve that, but I wonder how the academics, which is where I come from, uh, also should have the sense of their own creativity and their own. And I think that Sarah, you are more an academic. I would say <laughs> that you have that sense that also academics should acknowledge their own creativity as artists acknowledge their uh, uh, research part. Uh, do you have any vision of, on, on this issue? What is the question? 
Well, the two questions is why do you personally, how did you end up doing this research? And where do you come from as artists? And the other question is uh, how can we promote the more, um, more integration of the two in, by, uh, inter by making the academics more interested in the artistic side, which is, I know at the Linnaeus University they do that, and I know about your show there and all that because I go there a lot, and they have a sense of, uh, like Nicolas uh, Salmos, I'm sure you know him, uh, they have a sense of that integration, which in many other places they don't have. So what's your view of this issue? Hmm. Where can we start? We, we touched upon it, that when we... So there was this new department in Malmö um, where they were trying to envision something new. It was very much based on the digital uh, at K3, uh, Malmö University. And uh, different disciplines came together. Um, they called themselves the digital Bauhaus. Um, and uh, in our case, they had two positions announced. It was one in media and communication studies and one in interaction design. And we had, I was working at Swedish radio as a journalist and you were working at Swedish television, so it's public service. Uh, organizations as an you were working there as an interaction designer and we applied together basically saying like if you if you don't take both of us you get none um, and and there was an opening you know it was brand new they were envisioning new things and the digital was involved in this um, and at the same time there was uh, a a national design research school set up in Sweden to build up critical mass around design research. Um, and there were also big discussion. I mean, I'm, I'm going to the Swedish uh, context now because I think education and knowledge production is always context-based and very much dependent on the different institutions and ways of figuring things. That's also, you know, why we turn to Linnaeus. He figured the world in a very particular way. He said, God created the world, Linnaeus ordered it. So we have many who order the world for us, but we can also intervene and try to order it differently. Um, and uh, during our time as PhD students, uh, Sweden got a new kind of doctorate, a doctorate of fine arts. But we were already aiming for a doctorate uh, of philosophy. So we were, like for us, what we did in the particular work that we did during our PhD, we saw that there was already space for us with our practice-led research. We were looking at the UK, Finland, and elsewhere where kind of practice-led research Australia, where practice-led research was being um, envisioned and carried out. Um, and um, so although there is this new doctorate of artistic research, we didn't, we, we didn't defend our thesis within that realm. That but we're, we're, we're supervising student, PhD students now, and we're also sat on uh, both um, panels to assess PhD students and so on. So that, like, there is this constant discussion going on. Uh, and with this new entity in the world of the Doctorate of Fine Arts, things happen uh, and others, others need to adjust, just like, you know, any example. And that's perhaps what we tried to say <laughs> with our presentation, that when you put something out there, it's there in the world to use as an example. Um, it can have different powers to move things, but it's at least there as an example. So if nothing else, our work can work as an example of turning away from or <laughs> drawing on. I think it's a wonderful example of a perfect balance, and that's but what you say about your background explains that. It is really fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have time for another question. Is there a oh, nice, maybe in the back first? Hi, um, thank you for both of the talks, by the way. Um, I was 
I, I think I have a question for Sarah, if I got the name right. <laughs> um, I was wondering what uh, non-gendered machines, if they are non-gendered, um, and online avatars and accounts that are maybe anonymous or uh, exist outside of gender, um, how they affect this feminism in this technology and whether positively or negatively or both, maybe? That's a, that's a really, really good question because um, I think there was a, a large, there was like a sort of moment of literature about this from like the 90s where this was like the liberatory post-gender moment where you could be who you want to be and um, I think this is significant and I would definitely, um, I, I say yes to what you're saying. Um, my focus has been not so much on how gender is represented, but the way gender reappears in the structures of power. So for example, so it's not, so I think you're right and that that's something that's possible, but I've been more interested in like sort of why I start with that theory of the media as a technology that um, changes patterns of scale and pace and rhythms, time, because it's to, how do we move out of the field of representation? Um, to be able to address some of these issues about gender or, th or thinking post-gender outside of representation means addressing structures of power. So even in the first question that pointed out, oh, there's four women up here, right? That's an idea of gender that's still stuck on representation. Because you, like, so, if I'm not, not answering your question, it's like, but I'm more interested in like the material effects of technologies, the way they reverberate and produce different relations amongst people that don't necessarily have to do anything to do with male, female. So even for an example, I've written about how so many of our apps replicate mummy's labor. I don't really, it's not about mummy that I care about. It's the, that somebody else cares about mummy, apparently. But it's the idea that we have all these forms of labor that are being devalued, sold, like, through gigs, and so what has changed is maybe mummy's not doing the laundry, but somebody else is, who could be anybody. So do you sort of see what I mean about this changing the rhythms and patterns of life, and not just about representation? Because otherwise we would just say, like, we just want more diversity, we want more representation, or that we reduce it to that. So, but I do think the avatar is a hopeful technology, so. Great. Yeah, and we have time for a few more, so. Uh, thank you for your very interesting lectures. I have a very householdic practical question about uh, common mealworms. Because when they, yeah, I was wondering, when they digest the stereo foam, are they themselves then clean? Or do they become polluted? And what do you do with the polluted uh, bodies of the mealworms in the end? <laughs> Yes, so, I mean, we are not natural scientists, so we don't, we, we will not, probably not be the best ones to answer these questions, but of course, this is also part of, um, I mean, for example, what do we know about the well-being of the worms when they eat this, and this is only something that we can speculate on. Uh, they should be clean, but there are lots of other also materials part of, like you don't really know exactly what is, plastic can uh, include many different things. So there could be something left in the worms that isn't the main, wasn't the main focus of this study, for example. Uh, and also it's not like, um, yeah, so it has been shown that they can also, uh, that they will survive on this and they can grow and so on. But there are, of course, also questions in terms of the long-term effects and, and so on. And, um, and when they eat, they also spill. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the so like the feces aren't completely clean because they, they when they're munching away, they mm -hmm. they also spill. So there are like on a very yeah there are multiple risks, of course, with uh, this process. And we try it in a very mundane way, but just through that very mundane. A way of trying it out, you also become aware of, or you at least raise these kinds of questions, and that's also why we do it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great. Let's do one final question. Um, thank you for your um, presentation. It was quite intriguing. Um, um, I think my question is sort of touches both of your presentations in true different aspects. 
Um, which is, um, so I, I, I've been thinking um, quite a lot in, in, in coming up with um, um, trying to uh, de define a form of labor practice that would um, both understand the uh, human body as a living and historical archive, but at the same time uh, function as or en encapsulate labor divisions into cancelling it. And um, so I, um, I think you also mentioned Anna Singh's concept of unintentional design. Um, I wanted to ask you about her concept of contamination. Um, and, um, is it possible, you think, to see contamination as a form of collaboration? And if we do so, what kind of a production it might lead to? Is this for both panelists? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, so I think it's a really challenging question and really interesting one and perhaps also thinking it relates to our hesitation around using these kind of a nice figure such as composting, it's a kind of a friendly figure, whereas the contamination as a collaboration, was that what you said? Yeah, uh, is much more challenging and I don't really have a, a good answer to it, but it's... Um, Do you have an answer? <laughs> Anna Singh writes about this actually explicitly in, in the okay. um, mushroom at the end of this world. So this might be a nice reference. I don't know if that's something you were thinking with in that question. Oh, yeah, okay. sorry. Yeah, we can just recommend reading Anna Tsing. <laughs> <laughs> no, but of course the contamination, it's located somewhere. We go to a particular place, a geographical place, but it's also spread out. Um, because those products, I mean, the responsibilities for these, this contamination is spread out. It's uh, dependent on, a, on an economic system and of trade routes of particular kinds and um, of uh, an, a time, and I'm not saying that that time is over, <laughs> but an, of a time of really trying to start the new. It was very much of, you know, progress and um, and lots of wealth and uh, I think pride has been built up around this as well. Um, so what I'm thinking with collaboration is like what, yeah, what geographical and temporal and material entanglements are we talking about in a collaboration? Great. Well, I'd like to thank the panelists uh, for their incredible talks. Thank you very much.